Microchips, the brains of all modern electronics, have become the most important resource in the world and as such are able to determine the dynamic of geopolitics. The issue of where chips are being made has gained a lot of attention lately. But why is the geographic distribution of chip production so important? One reason is purely economic. The semiconductor industry is generally both high profit and high skill. A downfall of the industry in any given country would therefore lead to not only loss of many well-paid jobs, but also of opportunity to train highly skilled labor. Another reason is supply security. Microchips are basically the brains of all modern electronics. It's not just computers and smartphones that rely on them, but increasingly also cars, planes and even simple appliances such as fridges and washing machines. In recent years, we witnessed how many manufacturers ground to a halt due to chip shortages, most notably the car industry. Cutting-edge chips are also a necessity for AI development. And lastly, they are a crucial component of modern weapon systems. Computing power will be one of the determinants of military outcomes. Having at least some domestic supply is a good insurance against both intentional and unintentional interruption of supply from abroad. In this video, we will look at the chip production chain, where the big players stand and what are the geopolitical implications. In the second video, we will examine specific legislative and legal battles. Amidst the headlines about US offshoring manufacturing, China's technology theft and Chinese government heavily subsidizing its tech industry, one might get the feeling that the West is losing the chip war. But is it really so? In order to grasp the geopolitical implications of the semiconductor industry, it is necessary to first understand the production chain. The manufacturing itself gets the most attention. It is highly concentrated, mainly because it is the most capital-intensive part of the chain. A new modern fab, as chip fabrication plants are called, can cost upwards of $20 billion, an investment that only several giant companies can afford to make. There are also significant economies of scale, so a small competitor would not be able to produce profitably. We can divide chips into two main categories, memory chips and logic chips. Memory chips can be subdivided into DRAM, short-term working memory chips, and NAND flash, which provide long-term storage memory, not requiring electricity, think flash drive. The DRAM manufacturing is absolutely dominated by three companies. The leader is the South Korean giant Samsung, followed by SK Hynix, another South Korean company, and US Micron. Together, they have around 95% market share in DRAM chips. By comparison, the largest Chinese DRAM producer, CXMT, has less than 1% market share. The NAND flash market is slightly less concentrated. Amongst the leaders are again Samsung, SK Hynix and Micron, but also the American company Western Digital and Japanese Kyoxia. However, the largest Chinese NAND flash company, YMTC, with approximately 6% market share, has just introduced a world-leading technology despite the American sanctions. Overall, in the memory chips, we still see domination of USA and its allies, South Korea and Japan. Let's move on to logic chips, which contain the processing power of electronic devices. They can be subdivided for simplicity into CPUs and GPUs. CPUs represent the basic processing power of devices, whereas GPUs are superior for graphics rendering and machine learning. Both types are manufactured by the same companies. Taiwan's TSMC, the South Korean Samsung again, and the famous American Intel. They have both the most advanced technology and largest production capacity. But the largest Chinese logic chip producer, SMIC or SMIC, has significantly ramped up its capacity and made surprising technological advancements despite the sanctions. The production of chips is a multi-step process and the giant fabs need a variety of high-tech machinery for it. They buy this equipment from companies specialized in chip-making tools. The arguably most sophisticated part of the process is photolithography, basically printing of transistors by light. The most advanced lithography tools use extreme ultraviolet light or EUV. Herein lies another choke point. Only one company in the world is capable of making EUV lithography equipment, the Dutch company ASML. 
The EUV machine is a miracle of modern science and engineering, which costs $150 million apiece. It is made of more than half a million parts. The company is based in Netherlands, a US ally. Moreover, it has fabs in America. Only TSMC, Samsung and Intel own the EUV machines. Without EUV, it shouldn't be possible to make the most cutting-edge chips. The older generation of chips require deep ultraviolet light or DUV. But even the DUV machines are produced mainly by US and Japanese companies apart from ASML. But lithography is only one of many processes needed to produce chips. There are dozens of high-tech machines and they are mostly produced by American and Japanese firms. The leaders are Applied Materials and Tokyo Electron. The Chinese manufacturers are still largely dependent on equipment from its rivals. I have to ask you for a favor. I put a lot of effort into these videos. If you feel that I deserve it, please consider subscribing to this channel and hit the like button. When it comes to material, China is by far the largest producer of raw silicon, the dominant semiconductor material. However, to produce chips, you need ultra-pure silicon wafers. Market for the wafers is dominated by two Japanese companies, Shinetsu and Sumco, who provide more than half of the global supply. Chinese domestic wafer production cannot cover even the domestic demand, meaning they still rely on these foreign suppliers. Nevertheless, China is ramping up the wafer production capacity quickly, as with all other parts of the chain. Before they can start, the manufacturers first need a chip design, in the same way as a construction firm needs a blueprint before it can start the construction. Maurice Chang, the founder of TSMC, brought about a so-called fabless revolution. Chip design and manufacturing used to be done by the same company, but Chang built TSMC on a so-called foundry model. A foundry is a manufacturer that doesn't design the chips it produces, but instead offers its production capacity to fabless companies that design their own chips and outsource the manufacturing to the foundries. The success of TSMC led many companies to copy this model. Intel and Samsung still design most of the chips they produce, but they also launched a foundry side business. The dawn of the foundries in turn spurred a growth of many fabless companies, whose number is in the hundreds today. Apple, Amazon, Tesla, Google or Nvidia all designed their own chips. The separation allowed for a better efficiency. As a result, chip design is probably the least concentrated part of the industry. But still, there are important monopolies in chip design. Case in point, Nvidia. Nvidia totally dominates the market for dedicated GPUs with approximately 80% market share. AMD takes most of the rest. Both Nvidia and AMD are American companies. Since GPUs are a necessity for AI development, we can see another critical dependence of China. CPUs based on the x86 architecture, which are basically in all PCs with the recent exception of Apple computers, are still dominated by Intel with AMD in tow. Despite design being the least concentrated part of the production chain, in order to produce the extremely precise chip designs, the designers require specialized software, a so-called EDA. Here again, the majority of the world's chip design software is produced by a handful of firms, mostly American, such as Synopsys and Cadence, and the German giant Siemens. New software and software updates are another choke point through which the West could significantly damage the Chinese semiconductor industry. The production chain ends with testing and packaging. However, packaging in the context of chips does not mean wrapping them in plastic bag or cardboard. The process is still high-tech. The chips are coated in a protective cover to protect them against physical damage, contamination, heat or moisture. Wiring is also attached, so they can be connected with the device. These last stages of the production chain are either done by the manufacturers themselves or by specialized semiconductor packaging companies. The leaders are Taiwanese ASA Group, US MCOR and Chinese JSAT. But TSMC, Samsung and Intel have themselves advanced packaging technology. With the slowdown of improvement of individual chips, the advanced packaging and stacking of chips will play a greater role in the future. Still, packaging is less likely to become a choke point for China. Let's summarize and also add a caveat. Chinese chip designers are still dependent on foreign design software. Chinese tech companies still require chip designed by foreign designers, often American, such as Nvidia. 
Chinese equipment companies do not produce the cutting-edge tools, so Chinese manufacturers still often use equipment from abroad. And despite being the number one global producer of raw silicon, China has to import pure silicon wafers, mostly from Japan. Before the recent bans, China spent more money importing semiconductors than importing oil. While USA is not technologically dependent on China in the semiconductor industry, the Chinese market is often the largest customer of American chip firms, so there is a degree of codependence. Despite what has been said about the dependencies, China has fared surprisingly well in the face of the US sanctions, which cut off many of those critical components. However, as I will talk about in the next video, the sanctions have loopholes, so China has not been cut off as successfully as planned. Lastly, it's important to note that the Chinese semiconductor industry is heavily subsidized, and so it represents a financial burden for the Chinese state, at least as of now. Part of the research in this video is based on the book Chip War by Chris Miller. If you want to learn more about the topic, you can buy the book using the link in the description.